Okay, scientific paper on repetitive elements slams junk DNA. Okay, I know you love this paper. <laughs> oh, yeah. Take it I away. Do. Okay, because right. I'm a geneticist, so right. I geek out about DNA, um, <laughs> is what that means. But especially on about junk DNA, because this right. is one of the things. When people ask me as a biologist, they'll say, what is your favorite evidence, okay, for basically creation? My, my favorite evidence is the Bible. Okay, first and foremost. But if you want a scientific Amen. evidence, then my favorite evidence is junk DNA. Because junk DNA is a part of your genome that's supposedly part of your DNA that doesn't code for anything. About 98% of your DNA supposedly doesn't code for anything. That yeah, is that, a lot of junk, by th the way. This was supposed to be like the repetitive stuff that they, you know, I think they were saying upwards of 90% of that is just yeah. useless stuff. You don't need that. Right. And it's an uh, evolu evolutionary genome. leftover, supposedly. Exactly. Right? It's a, it's an, just like you find fossils in the ground, right? These are your genetic fossils, so to speak, from when you were a fish or when you were <laughs> a an ape-like creature or whatever, and it just hasn't got out of your DNA yet, so to speak. And this has been a popular argument on the secular side, For really, decades. since DNA had been discovered. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so they decided to look at a worm called a platyhelminth worm, and I'm only going to say this one time. Okay, yeah. its <laughs> name is Schistosoma mensoni. Okay. Bless you. That's it. Yeah, that's the only time I'm saying that. So yeah. that's a worm, and they decided to look at the junk DNA, supposedly junk DNA, in this worm. And when they looked at it, lo and behold, what did they find? It has function. It's doing something. It's really important. And one of the things that they then had to declare in the paper, and I'm definitely using this in one of my future <laughs> presentations, the days of junk DNA are over. I'm like, finally, right? Yeah. Because it says the common doctrine was that the non-protein coding part of eukaryotic, which is like us, worms, things like that, Mul consists of interspersed mm -hmm. useless sequences. What did they find out? They're not so useless after all. Yeah. And from a creation perspective, I'm kind of right. like, duh, right? Yeah. We know yeah. these sequences are important because they didn't just evolve. They came from the designer God, and they have function. Mm -hmm. They're doing things. So it's no surprise to That's us right. as a right. creationist. It just took the evolutionists a little bit of time to catch up. Right, and we, <laughs> we expect, you know, uh, the, the DNA to contain functional information. Now, of course, as a result of sin and the curse, there's going to be sure. things that get messed up. Uh, mutations right. and things yeah. like that that can cause problems. That's yeah. not an onward and upward evolutionary change. That's more of a downward uh, losing or filtering information in the case of natural selection. But, uh, you know, when I see something like this, I just think, wow, this is, this is an incredible confirmation of creationist predictions that have occurred over the past yeah. 50 well, years. And that's better. the key. When they first found this quote-unquote junk DNA, they did not understand what it did. So they said it has no, evolutionists said it had no purpose. These are just vestiges, leftovers from evolution. The creationists were saying, well, hold up a minute. Maybe we just don't fully understand right. it yet. If we just keep looking, maybe we'll figure this out. And lo and behold, that prediction has come true in many powerful right. ways. And actually, yeah. the more we look at DNA, the more complicated it actually is on multiple oh, yeah. levels, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. There's and so many layers of information. Yeah. So junk DNA turned out not to be junk, but what right. people were saying was really the junk. Yeah. There you go. I yeah. like that. Got it. Yeah. And, it's a and good just, summary. Yeah, and just to add good. one that's more point yeah. to that, yeah. okay, so it const really constrains evolution because initially they thought, oh, well, maybe all of this DNA that isn't used yeah. anymore, evolution can tinker with it and come up with new things to evolve yeah. new uh, organisms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, you don't have any DNA to tinker with now, so to speak. So how does right. that work? How are you going to get See, these that, new See, that's a things? really good point because they it thought is. all this extra DNA sitting yeah. there is what's going to be used uh, right. to turn into functional information, yeah. and it's not there. That, don't that, have it there. You can't just go switch that sort of mm -hmm. thing. You know, I remember years ago, I written an article on progeria, which is uh, a, a disease in, in man, where if you change just a single, have a single point mutation right. on one spot of those three billion base pairs, it causes this disease where you age and die quickly. Mm -hmm. By the time you're 13, 14 years old, you die of old age. Right. And, you know, I just think that's just a single point mutation. And they're saying 90%... Of, uh, right. of a lot of these genomes can easily be just thrown out and replaced. They're not even close. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, first ancient human DNA found from key Asian migration route. So this is a 7,000-year-old, um, supposedly, 7,000-year-old skeleton of a teenage hunter-gatherer from Sulawesi in Indonesia. So they are calling, they're coming from, they say, an ancient culture known as the Tolians, 
Um, and so this is along those kind of Indonesian islands, basically, is where this skeleton yeah. has been found. Now, it's Th not... Think of the area between Asia and Australia, some right. of those right down yeah. in there. That's all. So it's not 7,000 years old. We know that, because the Earth is only 6,000 years old. <laughs> so yeah. it can't be 7,000 years old. Correct. And most likely, these individuals represent a post Babel population, Correct. so they're less than 4,500 years old. Correct. Yeah, that's right. You know, as people are spreading out around the world, some people are going to die and that sort of thing. I sometimes wonder, how do they know they were a hunter-gatherer exactly, you know? I, mean, I know. I don't know you, how you, you know You find that. some bones, yeah. here's, here's what they did, you know, for, how do they know they didn't plant some crops here and there? But uh, at any rate, yes, post Babel. Now, what's interesting is they were able, able to uh, get a little DNA extracted, mm -hmm. which to me is kind of unique. Uh, sure. But they were able to get that, and it actually showed a little shared ancestry with the New Guineans as well as some of the Australian Aborigines. Mm -hmm. And that was unique, because we've already got connections between the New Guineans and the Australian Aborigines, so seeing her uh, interrelated with these guys as well as some Denosovans and some other uh, right. uh, you know, ancient lineages uh, down through there, that's pretty powerful evidence, I think, post-flood mm -hmm. uh, migratory uh, type of things. Right. All these happening. finds, they're people. We need to make that very, yes. very clear. Yeah. They're given different names, but they're 100% human. Their DNA is human. Does it show variation within humanity? Absolutely, it does. But Brian does not have cat DNA. I don't. I really don't. <laughs> Praise the Lord, all right? <laughs> all right. But uh, if we looked around the room right now, the variation within humanity with about 100 different people is astounding, right? Mm -hmm. right? And so we see the same thing in the past post Babel and throughout history. So it's not a big surprise from right. a biblical worldview. Right. And, you know, we talk about maybe, you know, you haven't heard the term denosimum, but just like we talk about Neanderthals, okay? These are ancient human lineages. Human. And we say ancient, I mean, just a few thousand years ago. They're, they're fully human, right? Mm -hmm. They just have certain characteristics that probably come from being a post Babel population that would have stayed together, you know, very tightly, not a lot of migration in and out. Certain characteristics become dominant as a result of that, even, and you see that in the DNA as well. Um, and so that's what we have. And over time, you know, for whatever reason, those populations maybe die out or become, you know, migrate in that's and right. out. So they just mm -hmm. sort of disappear. But we can still see some of those characteristics even in people today, that's just right. like we're seeing in these right. people from Indonesia and or the Gu New Guinea and, and mm -hmm. other places. And once so. again, the big problem are the dates, you know, not mm -hmm. just, you yeah. know, they, they, they assign 7,000 on that. But you keep reading through the article, they start talking about stuff 37,000 years ago or 60,000 years ago or 500,000 well, years ago. Bodie, didn't those bones come with labels with them telling us the date <laughs> of the bone? Did, don't you find it that way? Yeah, they just didn't translate oh. it right. Oh, okay, mistranslation, very good. <laughs> yeah. You know, they don't okay. come with labels. They must be interpreted with assumptions about the past. Yeah. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. By the way, Florella says here on Facebook on Ken Ham's page that they should watch Nathaniel Jensen videos on Answers.tv. And he's got a great series, one of our yeah. scientists yes. here. Uh, series on the hidden history of he's humanity. He's a brilliant geneticist. He really is, really yeah. well done. And so it's got a, it's a lot of videos. And there'll be a book coming out soon. Fairly as well. soon. That's right. Yeah. And so really, what he's done is shown how you can trace DNA through human history, and we're much more connected than we think we are. We're much more mutt than we think we are. Does really. that mean I'm more related to you than I think I am? It, so you're kind of part cat, I guess. Uh, <laughs> not good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can bear this any yeah, longer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this next headline might be kind of shocking, and you think, why would anyone ask that question? But just think about the time that we live in. Can man, can men get pregnant? Okay. That's a real question, by the way. Yeah. So this is a this is this article is from Not the Bee, and so they're they're uh, if anyone's familiar with Babylon Bee, so they make um, like sort of a lot of sarcasm, yeah. uh, funny like sort of fake news. But this Not the Bee is real news, and so they're saying this is an actual article. So if you go to Healthline, which is a, a you know health website, I, that's what's showing there in the other picture with the pregnant woman's belly there, and the answer is can men. Can men, why do I keep saying they're wrong? Can men get pregnant? Yes, is what the article says. All right? And these so are your health experts declaring this, by the way. It says, yes, it's possible, I'm, I'm quoting the article, yes, it's possible for men to become pregnant and give birth to children of their own. In fact, it's probably a lot more common than you might think. Okay, but what, who is actually getting pregnant? Is not, it men? Not men, not men, biological well, men, born men. Well, I love this, though, in the article. XY chromosome. <laughs> right, when yeah. they're arguing for this, they say, they say men can get pregnant. In order to explain, we'll need to break down some common misconceptions 
about how we understand the term man. Uh, so they redefine man to not be man so, we must, so that men can get pregnant. So the way we've understood men and women <laughs> since the dawn of humanity, that's misinformation. Yeah. And therefore, we got to redefine it. And then when you redefine a woman as a man, then now a man can become pregnant. Yeah. Well, maybe we can redefine pregnant to say it's not. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Very I mean, good. if it's going to be that arbitrary, just answer it with equal arbitrariness. Uh, well, can we redefine these health experts as not health experts and not listen to them at all? Yeah, yeah. sure. Maybe. Well, Why not? Right? Yeah. And I mean, even in the article, so it goes on to say, not all people who were assigned male at birth, right? That's AMAB. That's the abbreviation. That identify as men. Well, regardless of whether they identify as men or not, they are men. Right? right? And then it says, conversely, some people who were assigned female at birth, AFABs, identify as men. Uh, well, regardless of that, they're still women. Okay? Uh, and it, it just, it's just amazing to me. And they even go on to say, many, okay, this gets confusing, um, women, <laughs> uh, assigned female at birth, so women, who identify as men or who don't identify as women. All right. So you're either... As a woman, you're either identifying as a man or you're not identifying as a woman, but not a man. So, what are you identifying as? You're identifying as something else. Th okay, this kind of reminds me uh, of an gender? argument saying, okay, if, if someone wants to identify as a Martian and right. therefore aliens exist, right? Yep. do you buy into that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's no different. Well, it goes back to the previous article about the person who identifies as, as a different ethnicity. If you can do that, it's utterly arbitrary in definitions. And oftentimes, when you see these uh, words and these definitions employed in our culture, it's really an attempt by a certain group of people to redefine words, to kind of bend it to and their... And come up with new words, and come up with new words, new, idea, new interpretations that kind of bends to their will that leads to them having a benefit in society for their empowerment in certain ways. Now, right. I right. look out in my audience, and I would suggest the majority of our audience are probably not kids in high school, mm -hmm. Okay. Most of you have probably grown up with knowing what man and woman is. But yeah. you need to realize in our culture today, the next generation is being hit hard with these types they of are. things. Right. And to understand a lot of these arguments about, um, say, homosexual marriage or, or um, gender issues and the redefinitions of, of what's going on in the LGBT, we actually just put together a new book. This is a brand new book, actually. Uh, pretty hot off the press, The yep. Gender and Marriage War. We got a number of authors in here. We've, we were all actually yeah. involved in this, yep. as well as a number of others, to really help explain what's going on yep. uh, with this debate, what are the terminology, um, what's wrong with it. Uh, we're not afraid to, to point out the biblical errors in it. And bear in mind, the younger generations not only intellectually are being, being hit hard with bear this, in mind. But, also, there you go, <laughs> but also morally and emotionally, because in our culture today, if you don't agree with this, then you're seen as someone who's intolerant. You're being oppressive of other people. Mm -hmm. You're being immoral. You're treating people poorly. So they got a lot of weight on them to conform both from the intellectual attacks of redefinition and the, the emotional attacks of redefining morality. And so all of us should be able to give an answer for our hope, for the hope that we have in Christ. And, but the younger generations, they're catching a lot of heat and a lot of attacks on this area. So be sure we're equipping ourselves and those under our care to know what we believe and why, rooted in God's word, even on something as simple as men are men and women are women. Why? Because God made them that way starting in the book of Genesis. And, and, that's, and that's confirmed by science. <laughs> that's, right. the, that's the thing we have to realize is yeah. that God's word is always confirmed that's by right. what we see in the world. I mean, you know, it's funny because they often call creation scientists, you know, well, you guys, you're very anti-science. And I'm like, what could be more anti-science than saying men can get pregnant? I mean, you know, I, I always yeah. think that. I'm like, you're accusing us of being anti-science. That's anti-science. And so yeah. it's, it's just interesting. And, and again, what we see in God's word, what we yep. read about, we know science is consistent with that. Science confirms that. It's just people, again, wanting to construct their own definitions, their own realities, instead of, instead of again, starting with the truth of God's And they word. want to construct those new realities so they can justify their sin and suppress right. the truth and unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. yep. We often say at the ministry that all, all this stuff, it is ultimately a heart issue. It's a Romans 1 suppression of truth. We don't want to be accountable to a holy God. And so really understand that people who make this argument, even the person who said that men can't get pregnant, they're probably very smart intellectually speaking. Mm -hmm. But it's not a head issue. It's a right. heart issue right. that becomes a worldview issue. So we understand that. So we deal, yes, with the logical issues. We give answers, but also get to the heart issue. They need a savior. Right. They need to repent of their sin and put their faith in Christ. So we're all using these answers in defense of the faith to get to the answer, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.
You know, I'm seeing massive numbers of comments on here. I'm trying to keep up with them. <laughs> uh, a lot of them are pretty good. There's, there's, there's yeah. a lot of good debate going on in here. Um, there was one comment came up that's kind of, uh, you know, on the side of all this. Um, someone says, you realize Darwin was a believer, right? Um, was Charles Darwin a believer? No. Not no, that he we was know not. Yeah. Um, in his correspondence, he claimed that he was agnostic at best. And, uh, you know, I know there were some people in his family who would have been the first to admit if he would ever have one of those last-minute yeah. conversions, which some people try to throw out there. But um, as far as we know, Darwin never, ever professed a belief in Jesus yeah. Christ. And there's that popular legend that he had the deathbed conversion. Right. That seems to be just legend and not reality. Right. We pray we he did. We have an article on our yeah. website. Yeah. We hope he did. That'd be article. best for him for eternity. Right. But. Yeah. So. All right, these 125 million year old fossils may hold dinosaur DNA. Now, before you Jurassic go thinking, Park, come on. Jurassic <laughs> Park, all right, we're not there. Okay, that, yeah. Nature will um, find a way. I don't think that's going to be happening. So these are from uh, the Cauty Cauty Terex, which is found in uh, China and some fossils in China. And basically, what now, when they say they found DNA, <laughs> what they've done is they've done some staining on the, the cells that they find in the, in the bone there in the fossils. And they actually are showing, and you can kind of see it here, they're showing, um, oh, there it is. Um, they're showing the cell, so this is the cell, and this little bright pink thing in the middle is the nucleus, okay, of the cell. And that's where the DNA is. So when they stain it with the stain specific to DNA, it, show, it shows what looks like right. nuclei in the cell or nucleus in the cell. Oh, yeah, there it is. That, yeah. yeah, right there. <laughs> so if it is there, and it may be there, um, trust me, it's in pieces. <laughs> it's yeah. not all continuous and lined up and all connected. You can't just okay? pull it out and map it. No. No T-Rex anytime soon. It's not going to happen. That is sad. All oh. right. It's going to be in pieces. They say in the article, until yeah. recently, most paleontologists thought that rot and decay destroy the contents of cells before fossilization could take hold. Mm -hmm. uh, and, until recently, they thought, well, no way this tissue should last long enough to be preserved for millions of years or give a chance to mm -hmm. be fossilized. But yet we're literally finding all over the world and pretty much all the rock layers soft mm -hmm. tissue from dinosaurs still intact in their bones. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the tissue is still pliable and stretchy. Blood vessels and red blood cells still intact, maybe DNA. Yeah. And that all this just screams these creatures lived and died not that mm -hmm. long ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing. You see all these uh, dates of millions of years. You know, we typically find dinosaurs or even some of these ancient birds and so forth. Which you got to think the the world is now mixing dinosaurs and birds. Now you have to understand that. But uh, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous rock. That's all flood sediment about 4,350 years ago. That's right. And, uh, you know, when these things get fossilized, it's very rare to find any soft tissue, which we do find a little soft tissue from time to time, but let alone trying to find some intact DNA yeah. from the flood and, is very difficult. And the fact that we find soft tissue at all, like I say, it shows mm -hmm. that these can't be millions of years old. Right. Because one of the things they say is most organic molecules, they believe, things like proteins, DNA, can't last more than a million years. Right? And even that's, that's theoretical, yeah. yeah. Theoretically, yeah. right? And even that's really stretching it. But these are these are 125 million years old, right? Yeah, way, so way, way, way older yeah. than that. And so um, the fact that we can find any soft tissue, and we can. We can identify proteins a lot of times from these soft tissues like collagen and hemoglobin and things like that. We, like I say, so far we haven't found any intact DNA that we can identify, but it shows that these fossils had to be formed not that long ago, a few thousand years, like Bodhi said, as a result of Noah's flood, but also that they were buried very quickly and very deeply. Because in order to be able to preserve the tissue, you've got to have very specific conditions to do that. Right. Um, right. In and the a flood lab, is great conditions for that. Yeah, it in is. the lab, we freeze it to minus 80 degrees Celsius to try to maintain it, right? Yeah. It can't have been sitting out there on some sort of, you know, on the dirt, slowly getting buried over millions of years. So, it's not going to preserve it that Reality way. doesn't work that way. Yeah. It doesn't work right. that way. It has to be, yeah. in order to be preserved and, you know, find it a couple thousand years later or several thousand years later, you're going to have to bury it quickly and you're going to have to bury it deeply. Right. And there, so, There's a number of great resources that deal with dinosaurs yep. and some of these ancient birds and so forth uh, on our website. Uh, one of them that I would like to recommend, uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Clary has a book, uh, Dinosaurs, Marvels of God's Design. Absolutely it's brilliant great, book. I, I book. actually really like this book. Yep. I mean... What he's done in here is just absolutely amazing, but uh, giving you a really good understanding of dinosaurs. That's, it's really that's one easy of my to favorites. read. It's yeah. very popular level, but yeah. gives you a lot of those details. Well, you know what? I would suggest even a lot of kids, oh, yeah. you know, uh, eight, nine, ten years old on up could actually go into this book and get a lot out of it. There'll be oh, certain yeah, yeah. sections that would be tough for them, but they would love it. 
to me, it's probably one of the best books I've seen that talks about dinosaurs mm-hmm. from a biblical worldview that's geared towards right. teens and up. And, and you know, it's interesting. He's a geologist, yeah. and yet he can write yeah. in such a way that a lot of people can understand it. Yeah, yeah. So. that was good. Yeah. That's a good book. Okay, last article. Islands are cauldrons of evolution. And this, so this deals with um, some islands talking about the, the anoles, okay, A-N-O-L-E-S. So they're a type of lizard, neotropical lizard, um, in South America. And so they're talking about how, okay, so the common idea was that speciation when it occurs on islands, because there's not a lot of migration in or out. On now, the speciation island. is not the same thing as evolution. Is that correct? Right. So yeah. we'll get to that. So the okay. idea is that you would get a lot of speciation, a lot of specialization for that particular island. And then if those things somehow made their way back to the mainland, they would have a hard time adapting, or, you know, dealing with those environments because they've become so specialized. Right. And so what this article is showing with these lizards, that that might not actually be the case, that they still have the ability to adapt and deal with the mainland environment. But this is an evolution. Well, and that's something we often see. Just be really careful with the title. Islands are cauldrons of evolution. It makes it sound like if you go to an island, you'll see a fish evolving into a man right there in front of your eyes, right? You'll see the whole evolutionary process taking <laughs> place, and you'll see tweener animals like a frog evolving into a crocodile or something like that. Not at all. What this is simply referring to is variation, adaptation, speciation. Lizards will make all sorts of variations of lizards, and some unique to that environment. They're not changing into cows They're not or goats. changing into cats, right? Or anything <laughs> or like bears. that. Or bears. They're or staying pumpkins. in the same kind of animal. And that's what we expect in the biblical worldview. God made things to reproduce according to their kind. Dogs make dogs, cats, cats, lizards, lizards. That's what we see. Tons of variation because of the amazing amount of information God's put inside of living things. But dogs say dogs, cats, cats. Correct. There's no change of kinds, essentially. Right. Nope. They're still well. lizards. <laughs> They're just lizards are still lizards. They're just different species yeah. of lizards. And I think too, it really speaks because that's what you know. I think that's a great observation and a great assumption that they originally had mm-hmm. as far as well, they should be not as able to adapt to the mainland. So it's kind of cool to think that God has put either sufficient genetic diversity or sufficient mechanisms in them to be able to deal with whatever the environment might be. That just shows how He designed these organisms to be able to survive in a fallen world. Yeah, they probably used that inf- that, that junk DNA that they thought wasn't yeah. there to have some variation. Maybe in true. <laughs> Maybe true, actually. So, All right, so all right. we are out of time for today, so we'll see you back on Monday at 2 o'clock. God bless you, see guys. You guys.